Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Hello, welcome back to the next episode of Sunshine Reader and Rose Writer. All right, so this is technically day two of Black History Month. Um, so I have a pile of mostly children's books because I like reading children's books, but it's Black History Month. And so we're wanting to learn more about different people in Black America, Black history, going through experiences with Black culture. So why not start with someone way back in the early parts of America? This is Benjamin Banneker. So uh, let me just read the back of the book because it says it way better than I can. Benjamin Banneker grew up as a free Black man during colonial times. He worked hard on his family farm and was in charge when his father died. He was smart. He learned reading and mathematics. He learned how to build a clock. He studied the sky and the stars. He even wrote an almanac, almanac, a book that told the future movement of the stars. Now, he also helped design uh, the government plan for the capital. So basically, he planned the new government of America with its permanent capital. So Washington, D.C., he helped to design a lot of that space and where they actually put the capital. It was hard work, but he was used to working hard. He was still working hard and learning new things when he was 60 years old. And if I'm not mistaken, Benjamin Banneker, when he was 59, is when he helped to survey the land uh, and mark it out for the Capitol building. So 59, not 20, not 30, 59 years of age. That takes a lot of courage, a lot of grit. And imagine having that mindset of just, you know, I'm not too old. I'm going to do this and get this done. So that was amazing, amazing accomplishment as well. So Benjamin Banneker, an American mathematician and astronomer. Um, another book that actually, well, this one was kind of a favorite of me, but also my brother's. Uh, this one is I'll Fly My Own Plane. And if you look closely, you can kind of see the tiger... Uh, drawing on that airplane. This is about the Tuskegee Airmen. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with the Tuskegee Airmen. Um, they made a huge impact. They were pilots during the war, like a whole, um, you could call it like a black squadron because they were still kind of segregating them in the war. But anyway, um, they took down a lot of enemy fighters and they didn't really lose many people. But even when they came back home from fighting for their country, for this country, for America, they still had to fight a lot of segregation with their own people. Um, and in one of these books, I don't remember if it was in this book or the other book that I read, um, for them, they would go over and they would fight. But they weren't like angry that they had to fight, but they were angry when they came back home because they had to fight their own citizens, if you will. Like that's different. It's different to go and fight for your country against a different, um, I don't wanna say a different, against a different country, but it's different when you're fighting for a cause with your nation. But when your own nation is like, all right, that's it. We're not helping you. We're not fighting for you. We really don't like you anyway because you're black. And that means you're not of the same skin color of us, but also we have a long history of always pressing you down and justifying our actions. That's a little bit different. It's like, what, what, what? We were just on the same team, but far apart and separated. And now I'm coming back and I still am treated as if I don't belong here. And it's like, okay, I actually fought for you. I deserve this, but okay, cool. Um, so this, it really inspired my brothers and kind of me a little bit to like, you know, be a pilot, but also to embrace just great things like fly high, I'll fly my own plane. This was a wonderful book. I love the illustrations by Nicole Tadgill. She did a great job. She did, um, she did some sketches like you can see here. However, she also incorporated, there was, there's pictures of, um, real pictures of Tuskegee Airmen that are also incorporated in the story. Yeah, here we go. Right, yeah. So I love how you have a combination of the story, a boy who's willing to dream to dare, but you also tell the story that is not often told in history books as well. So this was I'll Fly My Own Plane. And then another book, um, Nobody Knows. 
Now this one is really sweet. Like I was just rereading this one today so I could get a better understanding to share it with you guys. And um, this one really, it really, it's not, hmm, it's a universal truth that every child at some point feels outcasted. Okay. Um, this child specifically, as you can see, is African-American. And he felt outcasted and was outcasted by some of his own classmates because of the color of his skin. Um, he was feeling embarrassed to show up at celebrations. Um, people would ask, like, why are you so dark anyway? Like, what, did you just stay outside too long in the sun? A lot of ignorant uh, responses like that. But when you grow up and you don't see many people who look like you, um, you begin to wonder, okay, am I the oddball or am I supposed to be this way kind of thing? Um, and so Nobody Knows was a great, um, it's a great children's book and it really breaks it down really simple. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows but Jesus. Glory, hallelujah. Um, that's a phrase that you'll find very often repeated in this book. Nobody knows. Highly recommend it. Um, another book that really, I love this book, when Joe Lewis won the title, this was great. So this is a little girl and she's talking with her grandfather and he tells her the story of when he was a young man and he heard about how Joe Lewis, a great boxer, won the title. Um, so she's actually named after Joe Lewis. If I'm not mistaken, her name is actually Joe like as in Josephine, but they shortened it to Joe. And since her last name is Lewis, it's called, she's called Joe Lewis. Pretty cool. Um, so her grandfather's telling her the history of her unusual name. And not only does she learn more about the famous boxer, Joe Lewis, she grows to understand more about her family's past and what that victory meant for all of them. So this is a great book to read as well. All right. Another book, <laughs> you probably are looking at this going, wait, wait, what? Yes. Yes, she's black. Yes, she's dressed like people from Little House on the Prey. And that's because uh, this is called I Have Heard of a Lamp. Now, in the late 1880s, signs went up all around America that land was free in the Oklahoma Territory. And it was free to everyone, whites, blacks, men and women alike. All you needed was a stake to a claim and hope to encourage with strength and strength and bleh, strength and perseverance. I cannot talk today, guys. So thousands of pioneers, many of them African Americans, newly freed from slavery, headed out west to carve out a new life in the Oklahoma soil. So this author is the National Book Award winner Joyce Carol Thomas. And she actually wrote the story and drew upon a lot of her own family history. And she crafted an unforgettable anthem to these brave and determined people from America's past. So this is a wonderful book. So just to throw this out there, there are such things as black cowboys. Actually, if you look it up, there are still black rodeos today. So it's not odd to think, oh, Black people out west. Yes, there are black people out west. I actually lived in Kansas for about, oh, five years of my life. There are black people out Kansas. There are black people in Arizona. There are black people in almost, almost any state that I'm aware of. I can't speak for every state because I haven't been to every single state. But there's a lot of things we don't think about of what did people do when they were freed from slavery? Some stayed in the south. Some went up north. Some went up to Canada. Um, and then others went out west. We don't really talk about that part of history. It's not really in our history books. Hint, hint, rewrite that. Um, but that's not an excuse for us to not learn about that. And I'll be honest and I'll be blunt. I don't know everything that there is to know about African-American history. Just because you're African-American doesn't mean, you know, like hundreds and hundreds of years of history. When it's not in the history books, you'd have to pass on all the stories to each family. And then on top of that, you have to save it somewhere. Um, however, we have the internet. So that's a good way to like look up things and learn more and more. Education, it's, it's kind of self-administered. Yes, you have access to books, but you still have to be willing to learn and take the initiative to learn. So you can educate yourself, especially if you have internet or a library, it's up to you. Um, anyway, so that was this book. Um, I have heard of a land. 
And then another book is actually called Working Cotton. Now this takes place a little bit after, oh, I can't remember the exact timeline. I think this takes place about 30 years or so after they are freed. Actually, I'm not finding the date. Anyway, so Working Cotton, it's about a family, uh, how they are picking cotton. Uh, they're still out down in the South. Uh, picking cotton for like their survival. That's their means of work and employment. And so that's something that they do in order to um, make money. And so it's, it's really interesting. Sometimes we just think, oh, people are picking cotton and then they kind of just like ended it. And that was it. No, there's still cotton fields that needed to be picked. Um, and a lot of people, even after uh, slavery had ended and the war was over, and they were free a little bit after the Emancipation Proclamation, which was like a year and a half later, um, they still had to have money in order to provide for their families. And so some would pick cotton because that's what they knew how to do. And others did other things. But it, this talks more about how um, it was hard work. Um, thankfully, this family is getting paid because it wasn't something they were forced to do anymore. They were getting paid to do it, but backbreaking work the sacks were heavy, walking down rows, picking the cotton, and how it would really tear your hands. Uh, that's kind of what I remember here. You got really calloused hands after picking the cotton. So it was something to put in perspective because as a young girl, you hear about people picking cotton. But I did not grow up around cotton, um, not until I was like maybe nine. I don't think I saw any cotton fields until I was like maybe nine years old. Um, but this book really gave, with the illustrations, it kind of showed a whole lot better of what it would look like to be picking cotton, the sweat, the pain, the toil, and these people are not getting beat for it. So it really stressed um, just my appreciation for having access to other jobs and that not being the only thing um, at my disposal. So I'm thankful for that as well. And then speaking of that time of right after that, we have Jamie's Freedom. So this is about African-Americans and the aftermath of the Civil War. Not going to lie. I read this book and I was like maybe 13. So this is about 11-year-old Janie. Um, where will Janie fly to freedom? 11-year-old Janie is confused. The war between the states is now over and Miss Laura, the widowed owner of Ruby Hill Plantation, has told the plantation's former slaves they're free to go. But for Janie, where? There are still many dangers in the South and many unknowns in the North. And leaving Georgia may eliminate any chance of Janie ever finding her mother. Can Janie's faith provide the wisdom and guidance she needs to face a world of new choices? And this is a great book. So if you're like a younger reader and you're like, eh, I like historic fiction but I like a little romance or eh, I like historic fiction, but I want something easier to read, but I'll, you know, I need it to be exciting. This is a good book to read. Like every now and then I think I still actually read this book. Um, it's, it's very informative and it gives you an interesting perspective. You are tracking 11 year old Janie who actually does end up leaving the plantation. Um, she goes with some friends who are also in that plantation and they are tracking up north. Now, you heard them say she's trying to find her mother. That is true. She's trying to find her mother. And I think her father is up there as well. Or her, her father is with her, one or the other. Um, but what is it like trying to go up north in the south? People still have a great dislike for you. People still are trying to keep you... Um, bound up in the racist shackles of slavery. What is that like when people are set against you and just hateful after the Civil War? Like, And I say that like on both sides. It does mention even in this book that yes, the, the North, the Union uh, soldiers did come through and they did like fight and they won, but they were also destroying some of the plantations and even still burning down all people's homes, whether they were slaves or white people or whatever, still causing a lot of havoc and people on all sides of the South 
all of them in some ways were fearful of when the soldiers would come. So I don't say it as in like, oh, yay, the Union soldiers were always welcome as heroes. They were to the extent of they were breaking down that barrier of the war. But if you're living, it just gives you a different perspective. My words are not coming to me today. I'm not going to lie. But um, I highly recommend the book. It gives you a different, fresh perspective on if you're living in this time, what you know is rapidly changing, but you know you have to go find other family members. And you know what? There's more that you can do now in life, but you can't read. Um, but you know that bigger and better things await you in a new place. How much are you willing to risk to go get it? That's kind of what you find in Janie's Freedom. So there's that one. And then um, there's the story of Ruby Bridges, the first black child to attend an all white elementary school. And this book, it's really short. Um, it talks about how brave and forgiving a six year old girl can be. So this is a really great book. I highly recommend it. Mine is not in the best of condition because we read it a lot when we were younger, which is great because that means we got to really know Ruby Bridges story. Um, and I, I think if you look at it of how important an education is and how her parents were willing and fought for her to go to that school and to continue to go to school, despite literally six, a six year old girl, mind you, um, parents were furious. They're threatening to kill her, to kill her family. They would show up and harass her at the school. They would took their children out of the school. And so she's the only one going to school for several months, actually, with just the teacher. The National Guard had to be called in to protect her, to walk her to and from school and kind of keep her family safe. Like, it wasn't like an easy, light thing to do. And I think sometimes we kind of forget, like, oh, they just sent a Black child into school one day. And everyone said, well, what are you doing here? But okay welcome no not at all um so yeah that was a very interesting book and i think after reading and hearing this story i appreciated my education so much more like i didn't have to like be yelling or screaming or kicking or i did not have to yell or scream or be cursed at by other people to get my education um just to have it not to be there but just to have education so I appreciated that. And then these last three books, whew, these last three books really hit home for me. Um, let's start with third place, Jasmine's Notebook. This is more so for teenagers. Um, Jasmine Shelby knows how to fight. After all, she's always had to. Her dad died a couple of years back. And now that her mom is in the hospital, it's just her and her sister, Cece. But that's okay by Jasmine. She's got her stoop on Amsterdam Avenue, where she can keep an eye on all the neighborhood action. She's got her friends Sophie and Destiny to keep her laughing. And most of all, she's got her notebook, filled to the rim with poetry, laughter, and her own irrepressible views on life, Harlem, and just about everything else. Uh, so this is also a Coretta Scott King Honor Award book. I really like this book. Like, I don't know how to say this, but... You Okay, I love to write, right? So when you have a book, this is one of the first books I remember as a Black teenager talking about another Black girl who was a writer. Like, So I, I have a special place in my heart for this book and this book, okay? So Jasmine's Notebook, highly recommend it for your teenagers. This book is only for your teenagers, and this is called The Skin I'm In. Whew. Okay, this book right here, it's good. Um, I will say on a transparent note, this is probably the book I can go back to in my teenage years and say this book gave me um, confidence in embracing the skin that I'm in. And that's because this girl wasn't just picked on for the skin that she was in, but also things at school, so many things going on. And she found herself in seemingly impossible situations. And she had many choices to make that were difficult, that were hard. She did not always make the right ones. But in the end, things kind of worked out. 
uh, things got way bad and way worse. And then they began to get better and worse and they got better. And I'm not going to give away the ending because I really recommend you read this book, The Skin I'm In by Sharon G. Flake. This is probably going to be one of the ones that I put down in the link so that you can actually find this one. I highly recommend this book. Um, so this is about Malika. She suffers every day from the taunts of the other kids in her class. If they're not getting at her about her homemade clothes or her good grades, it's about her dark skin. When a new teacher whose face is blotched with a startling white patch shows up at their school, Malika, Malika can see there's bound to be trouble for her too. But the new teacher's attitude surprises Malika. Miss Saunders loves the skin she's in. Can Malika learn to do the same? Yeah, I highly recommend this book. Let me actually see. There was a part where I was just reading and I would love to read it to you. And I should have actually looked it up sooner, but I didn't because I didn't think I was actually gonna have time to read it to you. But I'm gonna read this one to you because um, if I can find the spot. So she writes in her diary throughout this book. And so there are moments where you can kind of see things that she's thinking, things that she's going through. So when she's kind of talking back and forth with one of these girls who's kind of her friends, but really isn't because she is just using her to get some evil things done at the school. She goes to her diary and was like, dear diary, remember the acorn. Even when you don't see it growing, it's pushing past the dirt reaching for the sun, growing stronger. I look at the words on that paper. They sound good, all right, but are they true? I don't feel stronger or braver today than I did a few weeks back. This is stupid, I think, grabbing hold of the page and ripping it out of the diary. Then I ball that mess up and throw it in the trash can. And this is just one moment that is really good from the book. Um, and I think we've all felt like that. We're like, you know what? In this moment, this doesn't make sense. What's the point? Uh, you know what? Just tear this page out of this story. I don't want anyone else or myself to even have to go back and have this memory. So just take it out, erase it, forget about it. Um, so grateful though, that the story continues and things get better. So again, I highly recommend the skin I'm in. Okay, last but not least, this was my favorite book, actually, growing up about um, exploring about, um, okay, you know what, let me just read it. So this is The Red Rose Box by Brenda Woods. It's another Coretta Scott King Award Honor book. Um, let me read the back of it. The Birthday Present. On her 10th birthday, Leah Hopper receives a surprise gift from her glamorous Aunt Olivia, Mama's only sister who lives in Los Angeles. It's a red rose box, as you can kind of see there. It's a red rose box. Not many people in 1953, Sulphur, Louisiana, have seen such a beautiful traveling case covered with red roses, filled with jewelry, silk bedclothes, expensive soaps, and train tickets to California. Soon, Leah and her sister Ruth find themselves in Hollywood, far away from the cotton fields and Jim Crow laws of Sulphur. To Leah, California feels like freedom. But when disaster strikes back home, Leah and Ruth are forced to stay with Aunt Olivia permanently. Will freedom ever feel like home? Um, this is a beautiful book. Um, mm, it's not just about racism, Jim Crow laws, but it's also about a family torn apart by tragedy. Um, I'll just spoil it a little bit for you. The tragedy that they're talking about in the Red Rose Box, where um, Leah and her younger sister Ruth have to stay with her aunt, um, it's Louisiana, folks. So there's actually a hurricane. While Leah and Ruth are visiting their aunt for the second time in California, a hurricane strikes in Sulphur, like in the middle of the night, and not everyone in their town survives including their parents and some of their friends. And so because of that, the only relatives that they really have they could live with is their grandmother who still lives in Sulphur uh, with her with her husband, their, her, their grandparents who live in Louisiana or her aunt Olivia 
and her husband out in California. And the grandmother decides to send her to California because her house is very small. But in addition to that, she wants a better life for her nieces or granddaughters far away from Jim Crow laws and just um, with a better education and dreams that can become reality. Um, so it's a heart-wrenching story, but it's told in a beautiful way. Um, I really love that last page, actually, the last two pages, um, when Leah has graduated from, I think, sixth grade and is going to be going into um, seventh grade. Um, her grandmother comes back, they visit and everything. And it's been almost a year since her parents have both been tragically killed and that hurricane. And she's finally beginning to feel more like, okay, I, I feel out of place because I'm from Louisiana. I'm usually like out barefoot. We have possum stew. All, no, I'm not making that up. That's actually in the book. Okay. We have like possum stew and stuff like that. And I'm here with these people who like some of them have their own maids and they're black, but their maids are black and some of their maids are white. And it's, it's just a whole new world. And there's no different like drinking fountains. Like all of these things are different and are new for her. And she's like, okay, but I'm here in a new place new opportunities, and I'm loved by my aunt and my uncle, and I do still have my sister. And so when her grandmother is leaving, she knew that every time the train whistle blew twice, she would always miss her. Um, that night, I closed my bedroom door and took down my red rose box. I sat on the bed and unlocked it. I took out the pearls and put them around my neck. I tied the white scarf with black flowers around my head and clipped the earrings with purple stones to my ears. I held the photograph of Mama and Daddy in front of me, and I remembered. I remembered. Ruth turned the glass doorknob and walked in without knocking. She sat on the bed beside me, looked at the picture, and put her head on my shoulder. And this time, no tears came. And that is the conclusion of the Red Rose Box. If you get the chance, I highly recommend this beautiful, well-worded story. Um, it evokes a particularly painful and hopeful time through history um, in the 1950s of the States and everything, but it's such a wonderful job by Brenda Woods. So highly recommend that book. And I, I think these two books right here, if nothing else, read these books, okay? These two books, The Skin I'm In and The Red Rose Box. Like, it really doesn't matter what age you are. You should be at least a teenager. But of all ages, I highly recommend these two books. Um, and anyway, we're almost at 30 minutes, so we're going to wind it down now. And as always, I thank you so much for listening, for I this little chat. Um, it's been great being back and talking again. So I'll have to be more consistent with this. And speaking of being consistent, in this month of February, I'm going to try to go live every day of this month, except for Saturdays and probably not most Sundays. And I'm going to be reading from God's Trombones. And then I'm also going to be reading Up From Slavery by Booker T. Washington. So those are the two books that I'll be reading and I'll share them live, but then I'll also put them on a playlist that we can go back later and watch them as you would like. So again, guys, that's all I have for you. Thank you so much for listening. Um, honestly, truly be safe out here. Okay. And as you're safe, be kind, listen, be attentive, smile much, and love so much more. Take care, y'all. Bye-bye.